Then there was a study, a, a question, a general study question. And that was um, note cards. Should I write down to identify the bones and the muscles for the test? Can I have a booklet? Somebody booklet, booklet of somebody? So that's a good moment for that. Because one of the things, because on a flash, at this point on a flashcard, I would write it to a picture and then label the picture. Now, nobody sees your flashcard, so who cares what the picture looks like? That's not relevant. The only relevance is that you understand what you're writing and drawing. That's really only relevant. So I would urge everybody to draw versus just write the verbs. But then the other thing I have on the booklet, not on the last page, but the inside page, I have muscle flashcards. So if you go there, that goes to a Dropbox PDF that are all muscles, just single muscles, like six a page, so you can cut them out and make flashcards with it. So that might help. There's facial muscles in there. That's right there. And then actually, on the other one, the one on the right side, there's cadaver videos. And every muscle pretty much that we're going to go through in the body is going to be in a video clip, I don't know, 15 seconds to two minutes probably altogether, uh, described on a cadaver. I did that work at some point for myself to learn all the muscles. I put it here because it might be helpful for some of you that are wanting to go to the detail of that. That's not mandatory, but that might be helpful. And so uh, when, when we think of making flashcards, I think with that material, um, that's the way to do it. I think drawing, drawing and labeling. And then we're very defined of what we need to know for the test. So as soon as I give you the test list, then you're totally clean of what you need to know for the test. All right, so let's go to the lecture here. Let's see what colors do I want. There we go. So the first topic we're going to talk about in the lecture is the joints, articulations. There was a question, oh yeah, here. How, what's the prefix for joints? The prefix for joints is articulation, or A-R-T-H, R. Do I have that somewhere here? No. A R T H. So that's arth is the descriptor for joints. When I say I got arthritis, and everybody shrieks about that, I put an itis in the back of the joint, then I describe an inflammation. So arth means joint, itis would mean inflammation. Now that's a pathology. But whenever you see the word arth, you think of a joint. When we look at the, on the system of locomotion, which is the movement apparatus, locomotion means the self-propulsion of an animal, and we are animals as human beings. Uh, we're going to have the bones, all these bones we're going to start, we're studying. Now we just did these, but we're going to go through all of these. And those are the passive elements, and when the bones come together, they make joints. And then in order to move us around, we got to have muscles that attach to those bones so we can move. Because the muscles contract, and they move those limbs around. And then all of a sudden, you start moving, and you go like, woo, that's funky. I just watched, we watched the video, and I started walking, learning how to walk on a plane. And you know, you're like falling down and you can hardly, and that's when the nerves start growing and get faster and faster in the transmission into the muscles that then you can balance, you don't fall anymore. And so that's, that. we'll talk about that when we get to neurology a little bit more. But those two elements, those elements together will make us be able to move and have the movement apparatus described. And so the skeletal and the muscle system are described in a locomotion system, uh, in, in other words. Yeah, see here's ART, that's ART. So the joints are connections between bones, and, and this is a lecture that I just need to sort of get you through it. I don't need you to memorize all these names because they're all goofy. And so I'll tell you what I need you to know about it, but I still want to just talk about it because when we come to joints, you and I think this is a joint. 
But now we've already learned that in our reality, this is a joint, the suture, we talked about that already. And we also even talked about that in the hip, we have different bones that make it and it's fused. It's like, what? A joint in here? That's not a joint, that's a move, you know. And so they have these descriptions uh, and categories. And so when a joint is categorized according to how it moves, it's a, an immovable joint, a slightly movable joint, or a freely movable joint. And we're thinking of the freely movable joint as a joint, the elbow and finger joint. And so they use these names, synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, and diarthrosis. Uh, reference, not memorization, okay? You get that? Good. But you see here, the term ARTH is in there. So you see that term, you know, this is a joint. Then you can go further in looking. And then, you know, so that's how you read anatomy stuff, when you have to read things. Um, and then, we can also group joints together. How are they made together? Are they like, like in a suture, you got, these are really strong fibers in here. I mean, you can't move, it's not moving. You know, here, it's moving, I can move it. I'm not gonna go, you know, in the neck, I can adjust the neck, I can't go here and go and then it's adjusted, that's not gonna work. And so, the very strong fibers are in between those joints and hold it really strong together. So some joints have fibers connections, some joints have cartilage connections, like the rib right here. That's cartilage. That's bendy. The cartilage, when you think cartilage, you think it's bendy. It's moving. When you think of bone, you think it's rigid. And so some joints, this is, these are all joints. We just don't think of them as joints, but there's cartilage in between. So we have that as a possibility. And then some, of bo some are like the, uh, uh, the pelvis or even the sacrum. They are bony fusions, but they're still considered joints, technically speaking, because at some point they were joints. In our, at some point in our development. All right, so what else we know about that? The rest of that is not that important. So from there, we go right into the ones that we care about. These are the freely movable joints. Okay, that's the one we really care about from now on. Or else I just need you to understand it. So when we look at a freely movable joint, we look at a knee joint or an elbow joint, we gotta have a few features that come with that joint, as we need to describe. For once, at the end of the bone, we gotta have cartilage. Thank God. Cartilage is squeezy stuff. So you can compress it and it doesn't like, it gives a little bit, and then it lets go again. And so it's like bouncy a little bit. It's a lot of water in there. And it's not like if you, if you don't have, if you have a knee without cartilage, there is a cartilage question, sure. If you have a knee without cartilage, you've got bone on bone. It's like you're having two bricks walk on each other. Every time it's rubbing. Every time it's like mm, grinding. It hurts. When you break your bone, does the cartilage like go away? Well, if you break this part, we got issues. If you break it here, no, not so much for cartilage. If you, yeah, and then the other place that's really harsh to break if it's kids, and they break it in a place where the bone is growing in length, then it's disrupted. And then we have to be very careful about that. But yeah, the cartilage, once we, cartilage is, de is delicate. We, we have, if we damage it, like too much pounding, then it starts getting more brittle. It's not really regenerative. It's more like we feed it by moving. But it's one of those things, if you're like a maniac sports person and at 50 you can't walk anymore because you probably abuse a little too heavy. Like I go scooter, the scooter stuff, the line things. You know, I'm old now. I realize because I go scooter. Did you ever do that thing? That way, I went into Apollo, it was like this big, and all of a sudden I'm flying. I'm like, thank God I know how to ski because I was running out. But then the knees were hurting later on because there's too much, for me it's already too much compression. Out of cartilage, you can't go back, back obviously. Can you put something there? The there is a movie I have, a TED talk by Atoll, I think. And he talks about knee cartilage paste. I'm not sure where that is now at. Maybe but it's I, like jelly like. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they take cartilage from animals, they grind it up, and they strip it from the reactive proteins. Okay. And then they have a paste that they can put on. 
But I don't know where all that development is at at this point. I think that was like 2014 or so when that, that talk was made. I know now they're, they're, they're taking x-ray and three-dimensional pictures. They sent the thing in and make your own bone if you do a knee replacement, print it, you know, 3D print it. So we're at that level now. And that's much better than, you know, than just a generic already. But uh, cartilage paste, I'm not sure where that's at. But that seemed pretty successful. You know, ligaments are harder. Like, lig ligaments, ligaments is what connects the bone to bone to hold things together. That's a ligament. The tendon is on the muscle and then goes into a bone. So ligaments are strands of, of strong tissue. Uh, taking the proteins away from that, from the animal ligament, that's much harder than just mushing it up and breaking it down and then you just paste it. So I don't know where they're at, all with that at, but by the time we need it, we hopefully have it. <laughs> you and I, right? There. So we have this joint cartilage at the ends of the bone. So that's is is hyaline cartilage. We talked about the different types of cartilages. The end of bone cartilage is always hyaline cartilage. Um, and one of the things that's most important, I guess, for us is is we have a lot of collagen fibers in the cartilage, and we have a lot of water that's trapped in there. That makes it the cushy stuff, the watery stuff. It's a lot of water trapped. So if you don't drink water and you don't move around and walk around, then the stuff is going to deteriorate. I know, because it's avascular, it must receive nutrients by pressing synovial fluid into the cartilage, requiring regular movement, loading and unloading, that is, pressing on it like a sponge. You think a sponge or an earplug. You squeeze it, it, let it squeeze and it slowly comes back. Cartilage is like that. You squeeze it. It slowly, it, it, it squeezes the fluid out and it slowly think, fills back up with new fluid. And you need that process, and that process you do by, for example, walking. Um, and uh, lack of movement leads to degenerative changes, and that's known as osteoarthritis. Bone is osteoarthritis, is inflammation in the joint. So I got that straight out of the textbook. That's why I leave it in there. That's not my opinion, but I was pretty, happily impressed that the textbook, which takes years to get information into a textbook, because it's got to be solid, and the textbook says that. So couch potato people, just get with it. Half hour a day, we can all do it. Move around and move these things around so we actually get that exchange going on. Don't even think of your heart, just think of that. Uh, because regenerative powers are insignificant because we have no, well, it doesn't happen. The reason why, when we talked about bone, the bone has a little periosteum around it, the little stocking that holds the bone together, brings nutrients in, brings, I mean, uh, arteries in, and, 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 and nerves, and the cartilage doesn't have any of that. It's just by itself, it does not have vascularity, no blood supply. It would make no sense. If you think of a knee cartilage that moves all the time in here, right here, you have, you have blood in there, you're gonna bleed all the time. It's too delicate, you damage it all the time. Because you have to be able to squeeze it, don't squeeze it, squeeze it, don't squeeze it. Anyway, that's the cartilage. Then the next thing we have around it is a joint capsule. That surrounds the connecting bones. And that, um, that's this stuff here. From bone to bone. It goes from bone to bone. It goes around the whole thing. It holds, it holds the joint on the inside. And because on the inside, we end up having fluid. That synovial fluid. Here, synovial fluid. And that fluid is what brings the nutrients into the cartilage. And so that joint needs to be enclosed with, with, a, with a capsule that the fluid doesn't leak out. And also, it gives it a lot of strength. So the outer layer of this capsule is very strong fibers. Collagen fibers, when you think collagen fibers, you think strong, you can't pull it apart. And on the inside, we got a synovial membrane and that secretes the fluid into the joint capsule. And then we got that synovial fluid on the inside of the joint capsule. I guess that's about it. Yes? Oh, the pre-question? Wait, 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 I don't remember those pre-questions in my head. Oh, 
I don't read that thing. <laughs> Where is that? Most. That's the that's the cartilage, the protective material on the end of the bone. That's that cartilage I'm talking about. That's that highly cartilage part. Yeah. Um, Articular cartilage, you can call it. You just call it cartilage. That's cool, too. So from there, any other questions on this general concept? No? Good. Yeah? Yeah? No? Good. Okay. Because then, 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 then now, we looked at the general concept of synovial joints, and now we just have a whole different, different kinds of them. And we have to describe them. And we do this different description by what kind of movements do they generate. So some of these joints, like the hip joint, you can move that thing in all different directions really nice and free. That's known as a ball and socket joint. Because you have a ball shape, usually it's called a head, that corresponds with a concave socket that allows movement in all directions. That's nice. Thank God that's like that. Then we got a condyloid joint, and that's an oval shaped head and socket that allows movement in two main directions, like the wrist joint. So it's like this kind of joint stuff. Let's see if I find that in here in the picture. If you are in the picture. That condyloid joint. So it's like it's not quite a ball and socket, it more looks like something like that. A little bit. A little more restricted. It's a little hard to do this. It works, but it's most easy to do this, this, and this. And the the circumduction is a little harder. Then we got a hinge joint, and the hinge joint is a cylindrical bone then that fits into a gutter-like depression of another bone. We get movement of that like in one axis, like the the elbow joint, for example. So that's an interesting one. If you look at an elbow, that's like that. That's an elbow joint, like here. Oh, that's a little goofy, huh? But what, what we can see here, you see, this is very interesting bone. If you see the, the elbow bone here, the ulna, that's the ulna that goes to the pinky. We're going to learn that on Monday. The ulna goes to the pinky. And that bone in the back here, the elbow, this part of it, the elbow proper that you touch is that bone. And it sort of grabs the upper arm bone, the humerus, and it just holds it in like that. And you can only move this way. Only move this way. And sometimes people can't extend it properly, and then usually this joint has a problem. Usually this joint's having a problem. So that's a descriptive, that's a hinge joint. Then we got a pivot joint, and a pivot joint is, um, let me have the description, let me read the description because I can't say it like that. Is two, two, a bone end protrudes into a sleeve or ring that's composed of bone or end of ligament of an other bone. Movement is around the axis, so you just move around one axis. So you've got that type of bone, right on top, be C1 and C2. Do you have that ring thing on your table? Can I have one of those? Thank you. If you pick that up, and you take the, the bone that has a thing sticking out, there's one bone that has a thing sticking out, and then there's another bone that has a ring, it's just a ring. You see those two? Good, you put that on top of one another. Like that. Yes? So what makes you double jointed? Loose ligaments. This means that the joints are what? Like, uh, loose, loose ligaments. ligaments. It's like usually they're a little hypermobile. Like too loose. Oh, really? I don't know. It's okay. You'll survive. <laughs> <laughs> but did you do that? The ring on top? That's the stuff we have right on top underneath the head. That's two, these two bones. And these two bones, all they can do is turn and around one another. As a matter of fact, only the top, the ring bone, can rotate around the other bone. And that's because this, this piece here sticks right up over that ring, and there's really strong connections right behind it. So it only lets this move like that. And so when you say no, it all happens up here. 50% of no happens up here. Everything else is the rest of the spine. So that's an example of a pivot joint, the way it pivots around one, um, uh, one another. Ooh, got it.
And then we got a couple, we've got a saddle joint, we've got a plane joint. Um, let me see if I get a saddle joint example. It's two concave surfaces. Concave, you know, remember, I, I, oh, that brings me to the next topic. Uh, the word concave and convex. Did we talk about that yet? Okay, good. Um, so the word concave is the opposite of the word convex. And you often see that when you look at scoliosis. And scoliosis is a side bending of the spine. So when you take the spine from the front to the back, you want that to be straight, up and down. Sometimes though, you get these people that walk around totally crooked. You see that before? That's called scoliosis. It's a side bending of the spine. And then it describes often, it says, in a report you can read it, it says, the convexity of, and so you know, somebody just needs to show off, right? Using all these different words. Or they maybe want to make that the report can be written here, and you can read it in China too. So we use those technical words because they all speak the same language. That's the other reason why we do it. Is the sway back something different? Like it's, I think it's something that... Yeah, that's down here. Oh, okay. That's in the low back. Um, but when you, when you describe that curve, let's say you got a scoliosis right in here, it will be called a curve that is concave to this direction because the word concave means it bends this way versus the other way. So looking from this side, it looks like this is a concavity. So we would say the left side of this curvature is the concave surface. So concave means like it bends inward. So the way I remember that, I remember it's like, it's like this is a cave and I walk into it. It's concave. Convex is the other side. This is a very difficult concept. But it comes in medical reports. So I got to talk about it a little bit. Uh, and you have it in medical textbooks sometimes. And so when I describe this side, I could say in a report, I could say the right side of this is con convex because it bends out, not in. So that's the stuff. So concave is like, think of a cave. It goes into a cave. Convex is the bending on the outside. So it pushes you away. It pushes you away. So when you see concave surfaces, you also see that when you look at eyeglasses, concave and convex bent lenses, that's when they use that as well. So concave would be inward and convex would be outward then. Um, 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 and so here you have two concave surfaces that create two main movements. So, oops, let's look at that. Let's see if I have a joint of that. Yeah, right here. So here, you can see down here, the turn surfaces, this is concave. And this is concave. So you got like joints like that. They can move this way and they can move this way. That's it. And you got that around the thumb. Right here. There and there. You, you have a hard time. When you bend, you don't bend up here. You bend further back. When you rotate it, I mean. So that's an example of that sort of joint. And then the last joint that we need to know about, and these are not on the test. No, they're not. This is FYI. What? You got FYI in here? Uh-huh. For your own information. <laughs> but it's good to know this stuff, I tell you. And um, um, I just was too lazy to make test questions out of it, so that's all. Uh, and then the last one we describe is plane joints. And a plane joint is basically just two flat surfaces coming together and guiding a motion. And so you have that joint, like if you look in the back of your spine, you see all these vertebrae, there are all these little surfaces back in here. They're flat. And they help guide the motion of the spine. And those are called plane joints. We want to describe that. No, no, all of this was pre -reg All of this was so I can talk about this. This is the most important part here. So, because that tells me what movements do I do. And when I look at a muscle, I have to describe what movements is this muscle going to do. So like I look at the biceps, you know this one, right? I, I'm not going to show it. This is just like wobbling now. I'm getting old. You know? But the biceps in the front moves the arm up and bends the elbow, right? Bending, that's closing the joint down, like the angle here gets more acute, it closes down. That's called flexion. 
flexion as a descriptor is decreasing the angle of a joint. So that's flexion. So I can say the biceps flex, the biceps brachii flexes my elbow. That's a descriptive term like that. Then the one in the back, the triceps brachii, extends my elbow, that increases the angle of a joint. So I'll bring it back. So this angle goes closer with that flexion and it gets bigger again with the extension. So flexion extension is the opposite of one another. So that's one thing. Then the other thing is abduction and adduction. What? That's gonna get real confused. It's not a typo. It's really that way. So when, when I take the limbs, the limbs, and I take a limb, I move it away from the midline, I call that abduction, like A B. That's a B. A B duction. When I then take that limb again and I put it back to the midline, I call it adduction, a d d duction. And so the way I remember that, and it took me years, okay, is really like, what? Why is it like one letter? This is adduction is when I add a limb back to my body. It's a mathematical problem. And then abduction is the opposite. So then we don't worry about that. So here is the um, abduction, abduction thing as a picture. And then that circumduction, that's just rotating around in circles. But then we got a few more. We got rotations. We got a rotation going, well, the neck just rotates, just turns to the right, to the left. But then we also can call it, like in the leg, is a rotation where the foot turns out and we call it a lateral or even external rotation. Or when we then turn the foot back in, and we call that an internal or medial rotation. That's sort of a specialized, more specialized movement a little bit. And then we get really specialized, and we get to the forearm, and there we got two movements that are, one is, hand up and then one is hand down. Palm up, palm down. And the one for palm up, we call that supination. The one for palm down, we call that pronation. I do not really know where it come from, except for when I supinate, I can hold a bowl of soup in my hand. <laughs> and so that's how I remember that. And so it has to do because when we palm up, sort of thing, these two bone forearms, the ulna and the radius are parallel, when I go palm down, I pronate, they go and they cross over. So that's actually why the anatomical position is this position. So I can describe stuff in here, it's not like this, it's like all twisted, it's like how am I gonna describe stuff in there? Uh, and so that's supination, pronation. The foot is very funny, the foot is like you've got, it's not, it's not a flexion and an extension, they call this dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. When we dis remember the term stuff, I think there was probably one that says the dorsum of the foot. Maybe not. Maybe it's just a pedis. But the top of the foot is known as the, the dorsum of the foot. That's the dorsal side. So dorsiflexion is toe up. And plantar flexion is when you plant your foot down into the ground and that's, you plant it down. So it's plantar flexion. So you have to remember that. So some muscles dorsiflex, some muscles plantar flex. That's how we're going to describe that. And then this is when you twist your ankle. Have you ever twisted your ankle? Yes. yes. You roll your ankle? Yes, right over here, just recently. So uh, rolling your ankle you, is inversion of your ankle. So if you twist your ankle rolling, it's called an inversion spray. When you look at the word sprain, you're thinking you've got ligament problem. That's the word for problem. My emoji. Um, ligaments are the, the strong fibers that connect bone to bone. They're like rubber bands, rubber bands, connecting bone to bone. They're like a rubber band. A rubber band is like if you keep it stressed a long time, it's not going to come back at some point. If you use it like that, that's cool. If you go, it blasts. It's the same thing. If you do roll the ankle real bad, 
Easy. Snap. Do we need that? No. So, but we, you know, we don't know, we want to visualize the anatomy in the system because when I'm in my office, I close my eyes, I listen to the patient, and I visualize what they are talking to me about. How does it feel? We'll talk about that, you know, when, when I have my dad in his shoulder and I have to visualize, how did he fall? Or actually roll off, it was very brilliant, but it still, it hurts. You squish things, you squish things. And so, but it's a visualization of the anatomy. It's not just like, oh, the textbook says this, and the pull down menu says that. You're not gonna get anywhere with that. Not when you come to treatment. So you, I, I learn what things go here, and then I visualize what happens when I roll my ankle, who will get hurt? And then I come to the conclusion. That's why an anatomy book with pictures is gonna be heck of better than something that just has lines with words on it. Pictures are worth a thousand words. That's what I always think. All right, and then we have another movement here, the thumb. The thumb is, can oppose the fingers. That is a color, we are oppositional thumb. Have you ever seen a dog do that? Mm. No, you have not seen a dog do that. This is why we humans are developed the way we are. That's one reason. You will not be able to, not, to manipulate machinery without being able to do that. The oppositional thumb is very unique to us. And, and, and the position there for doing that is called opposition. So we gotta have an opponent's policy as long as brevis, tertius, whatever you wanna call it in there, but it's gonna be called opponent's something. Because that's the, when we look at muscle names, very often we use the term of the function to describe the muscle. Oh, look at that, that's it. Well, that's perfect because that brings me straight into the second part of this lecture. And the second part is the axial skeleton.